Section 1.3, Exact Linear Relationships. In this section, we're going to start looking at using straight lines to model real-life situations. So we're going to start off with the definition here, which is a linear model. A linear model is a non-vertical line that describes the relationship between two variables in an authentic situation. And just a note about our textbook here, the author, instead of referring to things as real-life problems, refers to them as authentic situations, so you'll see that quite a bit. And we are going to look at authentic situations in this section, but we're going to start off just getting some practice with linear models, so let's look at an example for that. Use the graph below to answer each of the, the questions that follow and they've shown us a linear model or a line here and they want to know what is the y value when x is negative 3. So the way you find that is you go on your x-axis and you count over 1, 2, 3 to get to the negative 3 side and then you move either straight up or straight down to hit your model. In this case that would be down. So we drop down until we hit that point and they want to know what is the y value. So then I would go across and see well how far down is that and it looks like that's two units down. So it looks like when x is negative 3, the y value is negative 2. And then just trying that one more time with a y value. Find the y value when x is 6. So we go on the x-axis over to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And then we would go up till we hit the graph. So there's the point we're talking about. And we'd want to know well, how high is that. And if you look across to the vertical axis you see your one unit up there so that implies that the y is equal to one when the x is six and next they want us to find something called the x-intercept and the y-intercept so the x-intercept is the ordered pair where our linear model intersects the x-axis so the x-intercept seems to be this point right here and if we were to label that that looks like that would be over 3 and up 0. So that would be our x-intercept, the ordered pair, 3, 0. And that's really important. We always write our intercepts as ordered pairs. The y-intercept of our graph would be the spot where our linear model hits the y-axis, and that seems to be this point right here. And that point is over 0 and down 1. So we'd say it's 0, comma, negative 1 and that's the way we'd write our answer for the y-intercept. That concept of the x-intercept, the y-intercept, we're going to talk about that in a lot of our authentic situations, so let's go ahead and define those and have a graph here to look at for that. So an x-intercept of a line is the point where the line and the x-axis intersect each other, so that would be right here where we're crossing the x-axis and the y-coordinate of the x-intercept is always a zero. It's a little hard to see here, possibly, so I'll rewrite that again. It's a comma zero. But we have not gone up or down. We've gone over a, but up none, down none. So that's why I have a zero there for our y-coordinate. And then the y-intercept is the point where the line and the y-axis intersect. So that would be this one right here. And the x-coordinate of the y-intercept is always a 0. And again, I don't know if you can see that really well, so I'll rewrite it. It's a 0, comma, b. But we're not going over to the right or to the left. We're only going up b. So the x-coordinate is a 0, and then the y-coordinate is whatever this height is. And so for x-intercepts, we will always get a 0 for the y-value. And for y-intercepts, we'll always get a 0 for the x-value. Okay, we will now move on to a real-life application that uses linear modeling. Let B be the balance in dollars of a student's checking account at T months since the student opened the account. A linear model is shown below. So the line itself is what we consider to be the linear model, and then that's in the context of a set of horizontal and vertical axes. On the horizontal axis, we've got the variable T, which represents the number of months since the student opened the account. And on the vertical axis, we've got the number of dollars that's in the account. So let's look at the questions they have for us. The first one is, what was the balance three months after the student opened the account? So what we'd want to do there is three months is a time. 
So we want to go onto the time axis and find that 3. And just like we did with the x and the y graph on the previous page, we want to try and figure out what this ordered pair is. Since this graph doesn't have the grid lines that the other one did, I'm using a straight edge to help draw a little bit better lines of what's going on. And it appears that when t is 3, the balance in the account is about 1500. We could represent that as an ordered pair here if we wanted, 3, 1500. So what is the balance three months after the student opened the account? It appears that it would be $1,500. Then moving on to the second question. When was the balance $500? So this time, since they're giving us something on the vertical, they're giving us the Y coordinate. And we'll start off with the $500. And we'll draw a cross from there until we hit the graph. And then from there, draw down. And it looks like that would be after five months. So again, we could write an ordered pair there if we want. It's five months, and it's $500. And they gave us the $500 part, so the answer to the question for us would be that five. So when was the balance $500? That would be five months after the student opened the account. All right, let's see what else they have for us here. What is the B-intercept of the model, and what does it mean in this situation? So, according to what we did in previous work, the B-intercept should be the place where the model intersects the B-axis. So, which of these axes is the B-axis? Um, the B stood for the balance, and that's our vertical axis. So, this would be the B-intercept right here. And we have not moved over any time yet, so that would be a 0 for the input and a 3,000 for the output. So that would be the B-intercept just as an ordered pair. So we can write that down here. The B-intercept is 0, 3,000. But then it would be good in terms of helping to interpret what does it mean in this situation. It would be good to put units. So that would be 0 months and three thousand dollars. So just thinking then about what that means, this would zero months has gone by since they opened the account, so this means when they initially opened the account there was three thousand dollars in there. So when the student initially opened the account there was a balance of $3,000. And then the final question is, what is the t-intercept of the model, and what does that mean in this situation? So the t-intercept would be the place where our model intersects the t-axis, so that looks like this spot right here would be the t-intercept and that is over 6 and up 0. So just as an ordered pair, it looks like it's 6, 0, and then we'll think about the units and making an interpretation of that one as well. So let's drop down here. So it's 6, 0, and then that would be 6 months and 0 dollars. So this isn't our interpretation, but just adding the units allows us to start thinking about it uh, and try and come up with the wording that we want to use before we start writing our sentences. So zero dollars means that the student has run out of money, I suppose, and it looks like it took six months for that to happen. So six months after the student opened the account, their balance was zero or they were out of money.
I think it's uh, worth a little bit of time to look up at the model again and just talk about some of um, the realisticness of this. So we're claiming this to be an authentic model. Um, but one of the things that I would point out that seems a little strange here is that there's just this constant drain on this account. It's almost like the account has a leak and money is just dripping out of it steadily and after six months it's all gone. And that's not the way it's going to work with an account. You would go every now and then and uh, maybe go to the ATM and take some money out. Maybe um, you would put a check in every once in a while and the balance would go up. So it may be that you know somebody gave this person $3,000 and they're spending it on their bills and it takes about six months for it to be gone. But for it to just be constantly and steadily draining probably isn't realistic. We would have a drop when rent was due and a drop when they paid for their electric bills and so on. So this is a, a rough model of what's going on, but it's probably a little bit oversimplified. All right, let's go ahead and look at another example of exact linear relationships, but this time starting out with a data set. So let's let S be a person's salary in thousands of dollars after he has worked for T years at a company. Some pairs of the values of T and S are shown in the table below. So we have things like after the person's worked there for six years, their pay is $32,000 a year. After two years, it was $24,000 a year. And they want us to start out by creating a scatter gram of the data using the grid provided right here. So the first thing we want to think about is axes and scale. Notice num none of the numbers are negative, so we can go ahead and focus all of our attention on quadrant one, and that means the vertical axis on the far left and the horizontal axis across the very bottom. Again, fairly standard to do that for real life stuff where in many of those applications you don't have negatives. I mentioned before that we'll usually want to have the first one be our horizontal and the second one be our vertical. That is a fairly standard situation for us to be in. And then we want to think about the scale next. So on the horizontal, we're starting at zero. Our largest number is eight. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten squares. So I think it seems fairly logical to just count in ones. And that seems to get us a good scale. One of the things you can look at to decide do I have a good scale is did your number with something nice? And is your data spread out more than halfway? So zero here, eight over there. That's more than half the grid. I did that by trial and error, but we could also do that using the method we saw in the previous section of taking the max number, dividing by the number of squares, which is 10. You get 0.8, you round that up to something nice, like one, which is what I used. Now, when you go to do the vertical, we run into a situation that we haven't seen before. And that is when your smallest number is closer to the maximum number than it is to zero. So $20,000 a year is closer to $36,000 a year than it is to $0 a year. When that's the case, no matter how you scale this, if you start at zero, your data is going to take up less than half the space, which is not something we want. So when that happens, between the origin and our first tick mark, we can make a double slash, which means we're going to break scale. And then we can start this at any number we want. And let's think about what our scale is going to be, and then I'll think about where to start. So here's our trick for scale, which I'll fill in for you at the bottom of this page. Instead of taking the max dividing by the number of squares, if you are going to cut out part of your graph so that you can start at a different number, then what you want to do is max minus min and divide by the number of squares you have left. So we've kind of used one square to indicate a break in scale with this double slash. Now we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten squares left. So each one could be 1.6, but we'll round that up to something nice, it would be two. I would suggest that you start off at something at or below your smallest number, but a multiple of your scale. So I'm gonna round this up to two. Two goes into 20, so starting at 20 is fine. But if this number had been 20.37, I'm not starting at 20.37. I'd still start at 20 because I want to start somewhere nice. And then rounding up, we're going to have a scale of 2. So 24, 28, 32, 36. We won't need that top one, but that would have been 40. 
uh, it may look like I numbered in fours, right? 20, 24, 28, 32. But what you have to remember is scale is about squares. So 22, 24, 26, 28, and so on. All right, now that we've got that number, we want to start plotting ordered pairs. So over 0 up to 20, be right here. Over 2, up 24, so 1, 2, and up to 24. Over to 4, up to 28, so over to 4, up to 28. Notice those are lining up nice. Over to 6, up to 32. And then over to 8, and up to 36. And this section is titled Exact Linear Relationships, so we shouldn't be surprised to see those lining up. And in fact, the next step is they want us to draw in a linear model by hand. So I'll bring in my ruler here. And then draw in the line. It is good, by the way, if your straight edge that you're using, you can see through. I think that's kind of nice to be able to lay that out there and still be able to see other stuff especially when we get to messier data sets in the next section. Looks like I missed a point by a little, but you know, we did okay there. All right, so now we want to use this model, uh, just like we did on the previous page, to answer questions. So estimate the person's salary after he has worked at the company for five years. So what I'm going to do is go over to five on the number line, because they said years, and that is the scale down here is years. Go to 5, I'm going to go up on the graph until I hit the line, and I'm going to go across and see what that is. And it seems to be at this kind of grid line right here, which if that's 28 and that's 32, that must have been 30. And then 30 what? $30,000. Which you could write that way. I guess we don't need the dollars word because we already put the dollar sign. You could just do it like that too, $30,000. The other thing you could do, instead of putting the word thousand, you could list the zeros. That would also be fine, and maybe even easier for people to understand. All right, now estimate when the person's salary would be 34,000. So to do that, since this is a amount of money, which is on the vertical, we'll go to 34. We'll go across until we hit the graph, and then we'll drop down to see where that was, and that looks like six, seven. So it looks like that would happen at seven years. And T was the number of years um, that they had worked at the company. So, so seven years after starting, maybe would be a good way to say that. And then lastly, what is the S-intercept of the model? And what does that mean in the situation? So remember the intercept is where we hit that axis. So... The S-intercept they want, so that would be where the graph hits the S-axis, which would be right there. As an ordered pair, that would be 0, 20, because we're over 0 up 20 at that point. If we put the units on there, that's 0 years and 20,000. So when we put those units on, that's helpful for interpreting, but that's not the interpretation. So I still want to say that out in words. So after they had worked there for zero years, they're making $20,000. After they're working there zero years is a strange phrase. So when they've been working there zero years, I'd say that's when they started. So when they started, they were making $20,000. And again, you could write it like that, or you could throw the zeros on. And when you're interpreting, I think throwing the zeros on would make it more understandable for people, which means it's a better interpretation, I think. And then lastly, the scaling note, which came up on this problem, is what you do if the smallest number to be plotted is closer to the largest number than it is to zero. We did have that come up in this case. When that happens, we should use a double slash mark to indicate a break in scale. So that's what I did right there with the two slashes. And then we can choose a good scale by subtracting the smallest number from the largest one and divide that result by the number of squares that are available. Remember, when you do the double slash, you're getting rid of one of your squares. It's no longer available. 
and then round up to a nice number. And then make sure you start with a nice number as well. Again, this particular time, our minimum 20 was a nice number. If that had been a 19.7, I would have probably started at 18. If it had been 15.3, I would have started at 14. I like to start at a multiple of my scale, which was twos, and something that can contain the minimum. So you gotta be at or below that. So if this is messy, just go down a little bit, try and use a multiple of your scale, it makes it a little nicer. All right, that wraps up this section.